Hello. Uh, last week at the Geneva Center for Security Policy, they held uh, their second international roundtable on the Syrian crisis, uh, where 60 experts agreed uh, that they have to deal with more urgency with the Syrian crisis. They expressed their deep concerns regarding the deteriorating humanitarian situation in Syria, where 2.5 million uh, refugees and 6.5 million internally displaced Syrians need urgent help. They also expressed their deep concern about the security situation where Syria became a magnet for Al-Qaeda types from around the world, where we have now estimated tens of thousands of fighters uh, that who, who are posing a risk to Syrian society, to the region, and to Europe uh, eventually. So I'm glad there is uh, now some sense of urgency in, in needing to deal with the crisis promptly. Uh, this is a tweet by the director of the Geneva Center. He said, we need to go back to the root causes of the crisis. We only talk now about symptoms and consequences. And I couldn't agree more with him. So this video presentation is my contribution to this uh, debate on the root causes of the crisis. Uh, before I, I proceed, I'll start with a small warning so that you're not disappointed with my uh, with the content here. Uh, my views are uh, fall mostly in the gray center of Syrian political spectrum, with some preference to the moderate part of the regime. I'm not a fan of the opposition, uh, and I'll explain why. But uh, so this video presentation is not going to be balanced. It's not meant to be balanced, even though I can. I'm usually very balanced in my uh, other video segments that I've done in Arabic before, but this one is meant to focus on the on what went wrong on the opposition side and more on the uh, coalition side, the coalition being the number of countries, organizations, individuals, media outlets that supported, that sided with uh, the opposition against the regime side in, in the Syrian uh, conflict. Uh, there's a lot to uh, to uh, to say about the mistakes they have done in that coalition, but no one is talking about it. It's only recently that because of failure we started to hear some polite criticism, and it's directed mostly at the Islamists uh, or at some of the opposition who failed to, to unite, etc. But there's much more to say. It's. Uh, um, it's, uh, it, I will try to manage within one hour, uh, but there's a lot more to say. And uh, if anyone would like to contact me after uh, who needs a backup for what I'm presenting or he needs to, to debate something with me, I'll be happy to do so. But uh, let's see what I can fit in one hour. And I hope I do not bore you with this, but it's, I think it's worth, it's something you need to hear if you are serious about trying to find a solution for the Syrian crisis. All right, so um, before I start, let me spend uh, time on Iraq. I spent maybe a couple of minutes. So we'll start with uh, an interview with Mad uh, former Secretary of State Ma Madeleine Albright uh, about the 500,000 uh, dead Iraqi children, uh, children that died as a result of uh, President Clinton deciding to do the peaceful. Uh, uh, approach of dealing with the uh, with Saddam Hussein and he said okay I'm not going to attack Iraq uh, we'll just uh, place sanctions on the country the sanctions led to the death of an estimated an estimate by the United Nations of up to 500,000 children and many more adults so see what Madeleine Albright says about that in a 60 minute interview we have heard that a half a million children have died I mean that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima and and you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Okay, so uh, the price of killing 500,000 children is worth it. Okay, let's look at the 2003 shock and awe campaign by the Bush administration, how it was uh, presented on CNN, for example. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, well, this went on for hours and hours and maybe days. Uh, I haven't seen anything like it in terms of the use of firepower. Uh, so, but how did they cover it in CNN? It was amazing. It was like a beautiful Hollywood movie. Uh, it's a display of American uh, technology and might. They were very proud of it. Uh, no one would care. No one would zoom. Uh, I don't think anybody had uh, remember CNN zooming on uh, dead children who were uh, bleeding to death uh, as a result of uh, some of these bombs not hitting exactly their target. So the second Iraq war led to say a rough estimate of a million people dead. One thing led to the other, uh, including uh, getting the Shia and Sunnis uh, uh, to, to fight each other and to hate each other. So uh, hundreds of thousands died in that war also. Uh, what did the media do? Uh, how did they cover all these things? Did the media cover either the 500,000 dead uh, Iraqi children or this um, unnecessary uh, second Iraq war? Uh, no. Um, Here's an article titled One Million, One Million Dead in Iraq, Six Reasons the Media Hide the True Human Toll of War from the American People and Why the American People Led Them. The article was written by um, where is it? Yeah, by John Turman, who is the, the executive director of MIT, MIT Center for International Studies. So he's giving six reasons why the media will not really criticize their government when there's a massive moral failure. You know, uh, it was a lie of WMDs, etc. We have to go there and uh, control WMDs and uh, hundreds of thousands of people died. And the same thing with the uh, Clinton's 500,000 children dying. Why doesn't the media cover it? For a number of reasons. One of them, he's giving six reasons. I think number one was that the media usually as you saw from the CNN example, supports their administration when they go to war. Usually the media, most most in the media, let's say 80% of the mainstream media, if not more, will support whatever their State Department spokesperson tells them at the latest briefing. If he tells them this is the right side of history, this is the wrong side of history, these are the good guys, these are the bad guys in some Middle Eastern country, right away you see the vast majority of reporters in mainstream media agreeing all right, so uh, any administration would have one to three or four years of a grace period where they will get no real criticism. Once they go to war, once they start taking action, uh, the media tends to support its government uh, in foreign affairs. You know, that's the patriotic thing to do. You don't create noise and bug them and, uh, and make things difficult for them. So... Uh, you don't put soldiers' uh, uh, life in, in danger, etc. So other other reasons is that you just uh, well read the article if you want. The other reasons are that the uh, you you just cannot deal with the fact that your country has done something that led to the killing of a million people. Everybody loves their country. They think the United States is the greatest country on earth, and definitely the United States is, has tons of beautiful things going for it, but. When it comes to war, uh, I think about six to seven million people died because of mostly unnecessary American wars after the Amer American initiated wars after the uh, World War Two. And often they start with some, uh, I mean, manufactured reason why they have to go to war. So uh, this introduction is is what am I trying to say here? Is that most of you in the media or analyst did not want to question the wisdom of the the international community's decision to topple the Syrian regime. Uh, I've been speaking to journalists all the time and I realized that whenever I mentioned to them, for example, the 500,000 dead Iraqi children in the 90s, I said, well, why don't you go after President Clinton? Isn't he a child, child killer? Because they were telling me before how do you support Assad? Uh, and I'm not exactly an Assad supporter, but uh, uh, I support the moderate part of the regime. But anyway, how do you support Assad after he killed, at the time it was, let's say, 500 or 1,000 people died in the conflict the first two, three months? Uh, I will tell them, well, 500 times more died in Iraq because your President Clinton took some decision of, uh, to place sanctions on the country. So why do you still go and shake his hands and you'll say, oh, Mr. President, I'm proud to meet you? Uh, 
and the answer usually I get from journalists is like, uh, hmm, can we not change topic? So it, nobody is ready to deal with such a large uh, moral challenge, uh, ch uh, such a large, uh, such a serious challenge to their moral uh, value system, their country's moral value system. Um, so I'll, I'll try to do that here. And forgive me, I'm, I'm not trying to to uh, be, uh, I mean, uh, aggressive or anything. It's just, it's something that you need to hear, I feel, in the Syria crisis, because you keep repeating the same mis pattern of mistakes, one crisis after the other. And we're seeing one Middle Eastern country destroyed after the other. Afghanistan used to be much more liberal before all this mess. Uh, Iraq was much more liberal. Libya was much more liberal. Egypt was much more liberal. Syria was much more liberal. And we're going one country after the other and you're destroying it. Obviously, you in the West do not know how to handle change in the Arab Islamic world. It, it takes a debate. You cannot just go there and do, do it your way. So uh, now it's a bit too late in Syria, but not totally we're not totally beyond uh, salvaging what's left of syria so uh, again please forgive me for my negativity i'm not uh, this is not something i enjoy uh, i'm usually a more friendly person in pers uh, if you meet me in person so okay so uh, that's an introduction now let me talk about this i mentioned the word the coalition be before I, I, this is something I'm borrowing from the 1990 coalition of the willing that uh, the first Bush administration formed in Iraq to get Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. Uh, that was a formal coalition. This time we don't have a formal coalition, mainly because uh, President Obama was not really interested, luckily, I would say, was not really interested in uh, in uh, in going all the way in, the, in, in uh, regime change in Syria by force. So... But nonetheless, there was a coalition formed that by itself, organically, if you want. It's a collection of countries, organizations, individuals, and media outlets that decided that they, they want to topple the Syrian regime, to put it that way. So, or to help the Syrian people gain their freedom for those who were genuine about their help. Uh, or their activism, in this case. So uh, let's look uh, very quickly at the uh, coalition, what it's made of. The coalition is made of Western and Gulf Cooperation Council countries and the, the Arab Gulf Co Cooperation Council countries. Uh, it's made of their mainstream media organizations like CNN in the United States, the BBC in England, Al Jazeera in Qatar, Al Arabiya in Saudi Arabia, and France 24 in France. It's made of the experts who told us, great, you know, let's support the Syrian people against the government, uh, Syria and media experts. It's made of human rights activists including many who are simply Syrian opposition and they branded themselves human human rights activists uh, because it sounds good. Uh, we, it's made of the vast network of the Muslim Brotherhood organization and its supporters across the Arab world uh, and its resources. It's made of liberal interventionists in the West, again, experts who are considered liberals and they are fully for intervening in the Syrian crisis by force. Uh, French colonialist Alain Juppé wanted, uh, was camped at the Security Council uh, trying to get Chapter 7 uh, authorization for him to send his air force to bomb Syria like he did in Libya. Um, young Arab activists, uh, the ones that CN loves to show, like the ones who were dancing in Tahrir Square when they celebrated uh, the toppling of Mubarak, uh, you know, the, these here, the same ones, the Syrian equivalent. Uh, which were termed, uh, branded the Syrian people as if they are, they represent the whole population. And then we had tons of paid professionals. Um, there was an article in the Financial Times last year that said Qatar spent, Qatar alone up to last year spent $3 billion on supporting the opposition and the revolutionaries and their rebels. Uh, by now, this is the figure is probably $4 billion or more. I would easily expect that Saudi Arabia spent an equal amount. Then we had another article uh, that Kuwait sp Kuwaiti private citizens donated hundreds of millions of dollars to the rebels and to the opposition. Then we have United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain. Um, all these Gulf states have uh, donated, plus France, the UK, and the US, 
plus uh, lots of uh, opposition uh, leaning uh, Syrian businessmen, rich Syrians who also spent tons of money on buying weapons and supporting the revolution. Um, so I would, I would estimate easily that this is the best financed uh, revolution, if you want to still call it a revolution, uh, in history. I don't think I think ten billion dollars is a good estimate of how much money was spent on it by everybody. Uh, that's a massive amount <laughs> for regime change, but the regime was not changed yet, despite all of that. So, uh, the paid professionals, uh, the money was spent for uh, weapons experts, for uh, who were, uh, security experts who were doing training for rebels. But at the earlier days, it was also spent for graphic designers who did the most amazing graphic design work for the revolution. I couldn't believe what I was seeing from day one. It was amazing graphics and it was, you know, they would change banners of the uh, opposition's uh, pages almost every day and they would always come up with great graphic design. I'm an expert, by the way, in graphic design, so I know I know what I was seeing uh, was expensive. So price was no, uh, not an issue. There was lots of uh, communication experts, uh, online online communication experts, and uh, legal experts, human resources experts, etc. You could see them working everywhere in Turkey, in Qatar, in uh, you know, in the hundreds sometimes in some organizations, and they were paid very well. So uh, this is the coalition. Okay, from now on, I'll keep repeat uh, referring to it as the coalition to topple the Syrian regime. What did the coalition do? I'll give you detailed examples after, but basically they, since day one, they've been working on building these massive, these giant pillars that lifted the revolution's platform uh, up there in the sky, way above people like me and millions like me who did not, uh, did not think the revolution was the wise approach for changing Syria, for, for taking Syria forward. Uh, so we remained way below them in many ways. How? Uh, well, let's look at the three pillars that were built for them, for their platform. The first pillar says this is the honorable and noble side of Syria. Uh, here you have uh, the Syrian people. They, they monopolized the term the Syrian people from the beginning. And who did that? Including CNN, including French and American government officials. Everyone in the coalition decided that these are the Syrian people. You carry a green flag, you are the Syrian people. Okay, uh, so therefore you're the honorable side. On the other side, you have the dictator who is killing his own people. Assad killed all 126,000 um, um, casualties of the Syrian crisis, as if the opposition and all their rebels, which are between 100 and 150,000, between Syrians and foreigners, did not kill anyone. It's only uh, Assad. Actually, I'll uh, show you uh, something that was on PBS two days ago. Uh, my uh, good friend, uh, Dr. Morhaf Jujati from the opposition, he was there and uh, he was asked something about whether the United States should uh, increase its intervention in Syria or not. And here's what he said. Well, look, that would be very dangerous for a United States who has been calling for the ouster of Assad, for him to go, that has drawn red lines because of the chemical weapons he has used. Uh, to suddenly uh, reverse its position. It would tarnish the credibility and the reputation of the United States. The United States has national security interests to advance here, its own, and it, it can only do that through the democratic forces in Syria. Not allowing to Assad to rule anymore. He is a dictator that has killed 126,000 of his people. Okay, so again, it's, this is a typical thing. He is a dictator who killed 126,000 of his own people. Nobody takes blame for the fact that they killed easily half of those 126,000. And I'll show you the real numbers now. Well, an estimate of the real numbers. Uh, and again, he mentioned Dr. Jwejati that uh, uh, these are Democrats. They're Jeffersonian Democrats uh, fighting for freedom, even though we know by now that the vast majority of the rebels are religious extremists. It's clear from what they're saying, and they want an Islamic state that has nothing to do with democracy. They tell you, we hate democracy, we want an Islamic state. and But still, in the United States, the talking heads would like to say these are the Democrats, or this is the Nobel side of the of the uh, crisis. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, the Syrian people are all here. On the other side, you have the, the, the dictator who killed 126,000 of his own people. Um, 
this is okay. Well, Dr. Morhab Jujati is an American uh, citizen. He's a professor of political science. Uh, he teaches in for uh, in the military uh, military college, etc. So he is an American, part of the American side of the coalition, also as be, as well as being part of the Syrian side of the coalition, the opposition. Uh, so uh, that was telling uh, his uh, the segment that I showed you. But I would like to show you from from the early days also how the uh, Western uh, media played the same role of saying, look, the Syrian people are all on this side. In fact, before going there, I will show you again the second pillar. The second pillar says we have strength. Uh, the first pillar says we have the moral high ground. The second one we sa says we are stronger. Why? Because all the people are on our side. There's no one on the other side or it's a small minority that still are afraid. They don't want to change. They, Assad cheated them and they believe him, etc. So um, we are stronger is because we have the larger numbers. Uh, this one reminds me of uh, Jesse Jackson's campaign uh, candidate, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson in 1988, I think, when he was running for president. He was the first African-American candidate to, to reach, I think, 20 to 25 percent popularity. Still, he was really far from uh, making it. But uh, in every speech, he was telling his uh, supporters, keep hope alive. So uh, keep hope alive. That's what the coalition was doing every day by convincing uh, the uh, the protesters at the early stage, the activists on Facebook and Twitter, and the rebels later who were carrying arms and fighting that you will win. Keep hope alive. You are absolutely going to topple the regime. That's why we kept hearing the regime's days are numbered. Uh, if you if you uh, Google it, I don't know if I have it here. Uh, let's Google. Uh, Assad's days are numbered. We end up with 107,000 results, which means, you know, we've been hearing this every single day of the Syrian crisis. Assad's days are numbered. And nobody would stop and say, hold a second, we got it wrong, you know, a thousand times so far. It's only recently that now people are saying, okay, it looks like the regime is not going to be toppled that it looks like the regime is popular in Syria enough and regionally and internationally. Okay, so who said Assad's days are numbered? President Clinton, U.S. intelligence said it, U.S. officials said it, uh, who else is there? Uh, Obama, the Arab League said it, and you're going to find uh, the French said it, the Israelis, the Turks, everybody, the, the Qataris, everybody was saying Assad's days are numbered. Here you have 107,000 results to, for if you want to go through to see how overconfident everybody was in the coalition. Okay, so that's often intentional, is to keep hope alive. So that, because if you don't keep hope alive, the uh, forces of the opposition will give up and say, oh, forget it, uh, we're not really that strong. But no, they were artificially told that you are much, much stronger than the regime. And now I will show you how the media also contributed to that. Uh, that's from my pers personal experience. Uh, uh, which convinced me since the beginning that the media is part of this uh, coalition in general. So I was interviewed, let's say, by the New York Times, by the late Anthony Shadid, who was probably one of the best journalists to cover the uh, the crisis. Uh, had a two-hour discussion with him. Everything was great, but maybe it was the editor of the New York Times when, when they published this article about Syrian exiles, how they are shaping the image of the revolt. Um, so uh, here at the last paragraph, uh, they quoted me. Uh, Mr. Otragi said, it's a I call it deception, and I'll explain why I'm calling it deception throughout this video. Uh, but then they say a somewhat lonely voice in the internet tumult. So uh, please pay attention to this word. I am a lonely voice. So what does it mean? On the other side, the, uh, all, the, uh, one, all the other uh, revolutionaries they interviewed before are the mainstream, are the Syrian people. I have a different opinion, but there's no one really who, 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 who agrees with me. Okay, so... Uh, regime supporters are a small, tiny minority. Let's look at The Guardian. It's the same issue. Uh, the Guardian were going through the uh, week's uh, review of what went on in Syria. So at six, uh, at this Guardian blog at uh, six or at ten or six a.m., they covered uh, uh, an interview I did on Blogging Heads TV. So how did they introduce me again? Camilo Tragi is a rarity. Uh, lonely voice at the New York Times here, a rarity. And then they, on top of that, I'm not a good person. I'm in a provocative appearance on Blogging Head. I said something outrageous, apparently. So uh, what was it? I said, uh, he also claims that the protest movement risks plunging Syria into a civil war. That was very early at the crisis. And I was always saying, 
don't make this mistake you're gonna get Syrian trouble and I actually said it here in the New York Times again uh, this is another interview in the New York Times with uh, Catherine, Catherine Zoff, I think. Uh, I said it doesn't, it doesn't take much to get people there to use arms, Mr. Otraji said. You can never control everybody in the streets. If you get people angry enough, the arms are there and they're going to go for it. And this is what happened much later. But uh, again, uh, uh, the Guardian found that to be provocative. All right, so uh, uh, actually there's one more I can show you just a moment since we're here because it's also disappointing. The Economist, British, you know, usually uh, conservative uh, style, the Economist Intelligence Unit on their Twitter account, they were ridiculing an article I wrote where I gave 10 reasons why there will be millions of Syrians who will not side with the revolution and which is, which is exactly what happened. But it, they found it odd, you know, and including the oddest one was something I mentioned that Israel will start having lots of allies inside Syria like they did in south of Sudan, like they, they did in Kurdistan, northern Iraq, like they did in Benghazi, like they did in March 14 movement in Lebanon, uh, in Fatah in Palestine, uh, the PLO. In every Arab country that becomes weak, Israel walks in and... and uh, makes alliances with part of the combatants or the uh, or or one of the two sides of any internal conflicts. So I said the same thing will happen in Syria if we become a weak country, and there are many patriotic Syrians who do not want that to either. So anyway, the the economists decided this is odd, and my whole article is is worth worthy of their ridicule. Again, the media deciding, and of course, if you read those top ten article uh, reasons, you're gonna find that exactly what happened. I said that women's rights will suffer, that minority rights will suffer, that the economy will be destroyed, that the country will lose its independence, etc. Everything took place after. Uh, this is again early article from the beginning of the conflict. But uh, the British journalist who who hated my article, he found it odd again. So again, odd minority, lonely voice, uh, provocative rarity. The media decided, and I to help build that second, these two pillars, okay? Uh, you're much stronger, the, the, you, are the, you have the, the numbers, you are stronger, and you are the noble side. The third pillar that the coalition built for the Syrian revolution or the opposition was that you're good for Syria. Don't even have a debate. I mean, the thing started, great. We're toppling the regime is good for Syria. Nobody wanted to pause and, and listen. Um, in fact, I did have journalists listening to me, but it, uh, it doesn't on the phone they say oh wow that's really interesting what you're saying uh, i learned a lot and everything but it doesn't really make it uh, uh, in a, in an opinion piece which is 800 words and they quote five different people uh, my two hours contribution ends up being one sentence because that's the space they can give for everyone per every person they interview uh, so there was that was no way to debate uh, the syria crisis and the options to take at the beginning and that was the biggest mistake that uh, uh, again, the coalition decided to build these three pillars for the revolution. What happened after, after they built the pillars for them? Well, what happened is that the revolution stopped, uh, Syrian revolutionaries stopped wanting to talk to the rest of us. They said, look, we toppled the regime, we win, and we shape Syria. Because Why? Because we're, we're the majority, we're the noble side, and we know what we're doing. This, these are the three pillars that the West and the Gulf Arabs built for them. They convinced them, you are great, you're smarter, you should lead Syria, etc. Um, let me go back to uh, the numbers that uh, Dr. Morhaj Wejati mentioned that Assad killed 126,000 of, of his people. So let's get that out of the way. Um, these are the numbers from the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. And uh, Syrian Observatory for Human Rights is the opposition outlet that is London-based. Uh, its numbers are definitely not going to be precise because nobody can count exactly who died, but they have good access to activists and uh, they count who died and whether they were uh, children or adults, so, uh, from which city, etc. So the United Nations, the West, and many NGOs have been relying on their numbers. So, so let me show, share with you their numbers for the most recent numbers they released, the ones for December 1st, 2013. They say, and again, they are opposition-leaning uh, organization. It's a small organization. Uh, anyway, uh, they say that 40% of those who died are regime casualties, which means the opposition killed them. Assad did not kill them. The opposition forces killed them. That's 40%. 
they say that 22% are rebels, the regime killed those rebels, but again, they're rebels, they're not civilians. Now, civilians are 35.3%. And who killed civilians? Both sides. You've seen the same rebels who were able to kill 40% of the total 126,000 dead. They surely have enough firepower to, by mistake, during exchanges with the regime, kill civilians. Even if we say that the regime killed more civilians because they have the MiGs and the big guns, uh, still, overall, we're looking at a 50-50 responsibility for the 126,000 casualties of the war, plus knowing that most of them are not civilians. Another thing I would like to add here is that one of my friends, a journalist by the name of Sharmin Narwani, interviewed the head of the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, and he, he, he showed her his uh, sources, uh, and he made it clear that a large number of these 35% which are classified as civilians were actually rebels. And that explains why only 22% of this spy are rebels versus 40% of Syrian forces, army and uh, semi-regular uh, militias fighting with the Syrian army. Uh, so half of these are actually rebels. When they die, their parents tell the organizers, the uh, the coordination committees in, in the local Syrian city that uh, their son was a civilian because they don't want the Syrian state to know he was a rebel. They're scared, maybe. So anyway, the, the actual number of Syrians is probably 15 percent, maximum 20 percent. And the rebels is 40 percent. And the Syrian army officers, uh, soldiers and irregular militias with the army, 40 percent. OK, let's get that out of the way because both sides are more or less equally responsible for the killing in Syria. OK. Another thing I would like to show from these numbers is that uh, uh, we have, uh, let's look at the foreign fighters. Another claim is that, oh, you know, the Syrian army is winning because it's brought in Hezbollah and Iran supporting it. Well, Iran has been supporting since the beginning with intelligence and training. That's mainly what Iran were doing. Uh, I don't think there were soldiers. There were very few. Well, there were, but very few. They were mostly there for training. Um, Hezbollah showed up later this year in 2013 they showed up to fight in areas near the Lebanese border and there were non-Syrian non, uh, uh, Shiite militias mainly from Iraq okay so I would estimate there is two to three thousand Iraqis uh, fighting in there plus two thousand from Hezbollah perhaps so uh, why what I can show you from these numbers is that only 232 Hezbollah fighters died so far and 265 Iraqis died. Total of 500. Let's look at the opposition's foreign fighters, the rebels' foreign fighters. The number of deaths, so, uh, those who died so far, is 6,261. 6,261. Uh, that's 12 times more than the number of the regime's foreign fighters who died it gives you an indication that the opposition has been relying to a much larger extent on foreigners helping them fight in Syria. And that should say something about the popularity of uh, the uh, opposition sides. They are popular. I'm not trying to say they're not popular, but not to the extent that they claim. All right. So uh, uh, next, let's talk about the coalition. I'll give you other examples of how the coalition works. So, you know, we have the uh, neocons that most of us in Syria despised before because they did the Iraq war. But uh, now Syrians who are uh, revolutionary extremists, uh, they love anyone who helps them, even McCain or Lieberman. Here they are in the visiting uh, the Syrian uh, refugee, not refugee camps, this is... Uh, yeah, refugee camps in southern Turkey and the rebel camps also and kissing children for photo opportunities. Uh, here is uh, uh, Syrian uh, revolution activists in the United States uh, posing with Likudist uh, philosopher Bernard Henri Levy, fr friend of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel. Again, something that Syrian people would not normally approve of. Um, let's look at uh, other things which were very disappointing for the rest of us Syrians. Mistakes is that those who used to be secular and you know, among the regime supporters, secularism is very important uh, demand or uh, f uh, prerequisite for uh, for the shape of future Syria. Uh, but the ones who are trying to reassure us in the opposition, uh, look, we are secular, we are secular, like uh, the first leader of the Syrian National Council, Burhan Ghalyoun, who is a French uh, Paris-based professor, 
well they are hand in hand uh, with the uh, head of the Muslim Brotherhood Qatar based mu- head of the Muslim Brotherhood and this man is not a moderate Muslim as people would try would try to portray him uh, we saw his uh, w- when they took power in Egypt what they tried to do so right away this is a huge mistake that we could not count on those who claim they are secular in the opposition because they are working with the Islamists and they are really just a cover for the Islamists. In fact, there's a there's a video clip by the head of the Muslim Brotherhood in Tunis- in uh, Sweden, where he was he did not know he was uh, filmed, uh, but it ended up on YouTube. He was telling his supporters, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Sweden, uh, look, uh, we put uh, we we the Muslim Brotherhood selected uh, Professor Galion to become the head of the SNC just as a figurehead. We know that the West likes that and the secular Syrians inside they like that, so. We don't want to scare them with us being leading the thing, so we put a figurehead. So anyway, that's big mistake. They think, uh, you know, after him they they brought a Christian, George Sabra, and a Kurd, always bringing some moderate to be the head of the opposition. But we know this this is pathetic because we know it's really it was always the Muslim Brotherhood that were running the show with their uh, sponsors uh, Qatar and Turkey and the United States. The uh, President Obama didn't really want to get involved in regime change uh, he's a wise man who saw previous regime change operations always failing so he did not want uh, that failure on uh, attributed to him but uh, secretary of state clinton was uh, fully sold on um, working with qatar and turkey who were the sponsors of the muslim brotherhood in the arab world to uh, to uh, in- install what they call moderate Islam in every country because they thought this is the solution where they will uh, moderate Islam will be friendly to the United States and uh, it will give the Syrian and Egyptian and whatever people what they want supposedly the people love moderate Islam but then we saw in Egypt when Morsi governed for a few months the people demonstrated in the street wanted to get rid of him uh, so uh, anyway that was also a huge mistake to believe in the Muslim Brotherhood project as being moderate Islam it's not it was fake in fact uh, there's a Der Spiegel uh, German magazine uh, article uh, I don't know if I'll have it here I'll show it to you it's uh, where they uh, quote uh, the foreign minister of Turkey as saying uh, he would like to be part of Europe so that uh, it's Turkey's role is to recover uh, uh, Spain, because Spain should be an Islamic country, it used to be uh, hundreds of years ago, and to make Europe an Islamic uh, continent. Uh, The same thing with Erdogan, Prime Minister Erdogan, he was saying that democracy is a train we take, and when we reach the station we like, we're going to descend, which means, you know, we take the democracy train until we reach the Islamic state, and then we get rid of democracy. So anyway, that was a mistake to believe in those who claimed, uh, oh, you know, moderate Islam is something you can work with. No, the Middle East cannot work with religion, period, because we saw it in Lebanon. It's a whole mess always trying to find between the, you know, the president has to always be a Christian. The prime minister has to always be a Sunni Muslim and Shiite, uh, Shiite Muslims. Well, they get uh, they get to keep Hezbollah's weapons for now until we find another solution. And Iraq's the same thing. It's it's more sectarian Shia control if you, the Iraqi army is all uh, you, you, you look at Iraqi army uh, uh, trucks and uh, cars and they all have uh, religious symbols Shia religious symbols on them so it, it just doesn't work you cannot bring religion into the state's affairs that was a huge mistake by the coalition trying to sell us on that idea and I'll show you like on the original where this whole thing started where the West would say, okay, let's work with Islamists, they're good for us. But they always work for them until they get what they want, then they say, oh, okay, we decided you're not good for, good for us, we'll get rid of you. But it's too late then, the mess started. This is Ronald Reagan meeting with the Taliban and the jihadists in 1985 when they were fighting on his behalf, the Russians. And he said, these gentlemen are the moral equivalents of America's founding fathers. Again, that morality pillar that I showed you here the coalition always builds this is the morality pillar the coalition will always build that for their support their okay I'm sorry to say their puppets basically in any uh, in any uh, uh, conflict in an Arab or Muslim country Um, what else can I show you here Um, so I was um, Let's uh, okay. I'll I'll go randomly through a number of things I would like to share with you. Again, Anthony Shadid uh, later wrote in uh, I think 29th of June. He wrote an article saying, quoting an opposition supporter by the name of 
with Sam Tarif, who used to be quoted every single day in the New York Times and everywhere. I don't know, he works in some human rights organization, but uh, he was fully working for the opposition to topple the Syrian regime. He was quoted as some executive director of Insan, a Syrian human rights group, as if he is neutral. But So he said, oh, the Syrian army withdrew from Hama because it's exhaustion, they're exhausted, and lack of resources and lack of finances. It's over for them. They're exhausted, they have nothing. So I wrote to uh, Anthony Shadid an email saying, oh, seriously, Anthony, come on, you believe this quote? Uh, you think the uh, the protesters are not exhausted and the soldiers are exhausted? The protesters in better, are they in better physical shape? The soldiers are overweight couch potatoes, for example. That's why they would be exhausted. Uh, and uh, so I told him, I don't like the sources, your opposition sources. And he says, uh, no, I trust uh, Wissam. I, I have to say, I find Wissam intelligent and interesting with an attempt to shoot straight, etc. And there is no question about exhaustion. This is in June 2011. He's, he says there's no question that the army, Syrian army, is exhausted. And this is coming from uh, multiple sources over a week now, etc. So, again, the op Syrian opposition were very good in fooling Western, dipl Western even the smartest. Anthony Shadid is really smart and he speaks Arabic and everything. Uh, was uh, the late Anthony Shadid. So, they they really fooled them and they and the... Whether they were fooled or they really wanted to support the revolution, it was being naive, thinking that, oh, the revolution is beautiful, it's secular, it's good for Syria. All right, well, uh, let me show you the result of what happens when the uh, when you pamper them like this, when you make them tell them you are smart, you're noble, you're strong, you're great, everything. Well, they become like spoiled children and become not interested to talk to the rest of us Syrians. So I'll show you examples of what my former friends who became opposition figures, uh, what uh, they were, uh, what, what, how they were handling the rest of us. So uh, Robin Yassin Kassab, would, uh, who, who's an author, he wrote a nice book on Syria, a novel, and he's a journalist. So he says, almost, of course, almost everybody on earth is on a higher moral plane than Otragi, myself. And then he called me a traitor, propagandist for torture, and that I have a few months left. I don't know, as if, as if I am part of a regime or something, which I'm not part of anything. So uh, it was that kind of attitude from all of them. Uh, here is uh, Gillian York. She's, uh, she writes in The Guardian. She's an expert on online communication. Again, she writes as a neutral American observer, but look at her in her Facebook page, and you realize she's absolutely furious that the New York Times allowed to, pub to publish an article, one article that was uh, uh, critical of the opposition, of the revolutions. So, and she's also furious that uh, in that article, Sharmin Nirwani quoted uh, uh, my analysis of the Facebook polls, which was very useful. If you want to, I'll put the links under this video. Uh, they showed that the regime has, is equally popular, sub equally popular to the opposition. And in fact, it had a 5% advantage over the opposition. That was the first year. So anyway, uh, here is this American who's supposed to be neutral, but uh, she's obviously very emotionally involved in the side of the revolution. And here are Syrian activists, also all of them very smart. Uh, they used to be friends, all of them, uh, telling her, oh, you know, sheer stupidity, uh, lack of horses, they sat at the donkeys. Uh, that, it was this totally arrogant uh, uh, attitude. They were, they were on a high cloud. Uh, uh, whenever I would go and uh, try to question something they write, all I get is, oh, please, look, I can't waste time on you. I have a revolution to run. Uh, sorry, I don't have time for you. Or they would ridicule me or they will tell me how my moral system is absolutely, hor uh, you know, uh, the worst on this planet, as I showed you. Let me show you more uh, examples of this coalition. Uh, so here we have a Stephen Heidemann. Actually, before I show you that, let me show you uh, the United States Institute for Peace, where he works. Um, here he is, uh, Dr. Heidemann. He's a Middle East and Syria expert. Uh, so uh, he was the lead facilitator. That's the term they used for where he's. It, it implies that he was totally neutral. He was just a facilitator. You know, they need photocopies. He will get them photocopies or something. Um, I'm being sarcastic. For he was the lead facilitator for the day after project. It's a project of Syrian opposition uh, that they will. They were uh, saying, okay, we're toppling the regime very soon now. Obviously, that was 15, 16 months ago, I think. Okay, so they were saying, okay, since we're toppling the regime very soon, let's meet and 
prepare the plans where we will take over right after so that we're ready on the legally and on uh, we have psychologists to help the, the uh, those in shock and everything so uh, I'll borrow something in the way they described on their website the day after project to explain again uh, the, the problem here it says to ensure not to ensure huh? they're that confident to ensure a successful and orderly process of uh, you know taking over after the regime the day after project convened approximately 45 syrians representing the full spectrum sounds good right of the opposition is the full spectrum of the opposition only we don't need to sample anything outside the opposition you know these are regime supporters we don't you know they're bad syrians we don't talk to them so again they sampled the opposition only and uh, just a reminder also of what the United States Institute for, of Peace, where you know it's supposed to find peaceful resolution to crisis, it took sides um, since the beginning. Here is something from October 2011, since the beginning of the crisis. Here they were, Assad's regime will collapse. They've already decided, they know what they're doing, they're experts, the Assad regime will collapse and we're working on that possibility only. We put all our eggs in one, bas one basket. Now, if you, wanted to, if you want to see why uh, this total commitment to opposition, uh, uh, I'll show you uh, a more frank, it's always, you get always uh, on the Facebook, you get the more frank uh, uh, depiction of what's going into somebody's mind because they're free, it's their own page. So here's the same Dr. Heidemann who's supposed to be neutral, uh, they called him, uh, I don't know, elite fac facilitator. Uh, He's, he's mad at Kofi Annan for uh, going to Syria and meeting with President Assad and talking to him. Kofi Annan tried to find a peaceful resolution to the crisis last year, but everybody attacked him, including Mr. Stephen Heidemann, who works for the United States Institute of Peace. So he was saying here, Kofi Annan, please shut up. So I found that outrageous. But I told him, so Stephen, are you sure you work for the U.S. Institute for Peace or War? because he was calling for military intervention in Syria, for uh, uh, arming the rebels, etc. And for that, for asking him that, here's what, here's what I got from him as an answer. I'm long past being surprised at the depth of the, uh, to which regime psychopaths will sink. This moves beyond deplorable into the realm of the obscene. The old line, have you no decency, sir, is useless when what's missing is so much more profound than mere decency. Okay, I'm not angry or anything. I'm just showing you examples of how the coalition messed up. How the coalition was took sides not only rationally. They got so involved into this conflict, they wanted to win. This is a man who wanted to win. It's not like he is calmly taking rational decisions. And uh, once you start having the emotional system deciding on your behalf, uh, then you will make mistakes. And you made huge mistakes, including the biggest one is calculating that the Assad regime is is uh, on the wrong, si wrong side of the history and the opposition is on the right side of history and two that uh, the numbers and the uh, everything tells you that the regime will fall soon all right so uh, these are certain examples you know another example the BBC Arabic uh, giving an overview of what's happening in the changes in the Arab world very early at the uh, process in Syria they've already changed the flag of Syria to the green flag this is so unorthodox for the BBC, uh, an organization like the BBC, but they did. That's the Arabic version of the BBC. All right, uh, let's look at other examples of this uh, coalition. Um, here is uh, this gentleman is an advisor for French Foreign Ministry on uh, the Levant, Levant affairs, Syria and Lebanon. And, uh, you know, he became a total propagandist for the Syrian revolution, opposition. You'll see him uh, always promoting uh, arming the rebels, always, you know, f making fun of Assad, uh, making fun of Assad's uh, speech, making fun of Assad. Uh, and he's saying, oh, we don't need to analyze his speech. He's going to fall very soon. Uh, here it says, Khitab al which means the goodbye speech, which was a year ago, roughly. So again, miscalculations, total recklessness, I find. Um, all right, what else can I show you among the coalition's uh, mistakes? Um, the main page of the revol Syrian revolution, which everybody loved until last year they started to be ashamed of, uh, of being associated with, was run with the uh, young Muslim Brotherhood uh, Syrian expat. I think he's in Sweden. He's a, he's a 
he, he's been trained by NGOs to try to sound secular and progressive, but it's always been funny because you get the feeling when you read the language on that most popular revolution page uh, that it's a mixture between uh, between uh, NGO talk, a politically correct uh, language, and Muslim Brotherhood language. So. Uh, so the, the example I'm going to show you here, and they're all uh, similar, uh, is that uh, he's saying, look, we know that 99.99% of the Syrian people are with us. And that's from the, from the revolutionaries who were complaining that uh, the dictator Bashar al-Assad won in 2007 his elections supposedly with 97% approval. So they did not get into power yet and they're already taking the 97% of the Ba'athist regime to the 99.99%. Uh, small things like that maybe do not, did not make, make uh, any one of you alarmed but uh, it should have because that page I saw all my friends who are journalists, Western journalists, oh they loved it, they liked it and they will quote from it and until now many are quoting what this page, uh, content from this page. Uh, all right, I'll show you other examples from this coalition. Um, let's look at when they started arming rebels. Okay, the United States said, okay, well, the past year we've been discussing what, how can we arm the carefully, the carefully vetted rebels? Okay, as if there's something carefully vetted implies we will pick, we will interview rebels who are secular and moderate and responsible, of course. So, okay, how do we pick, how do we decide if someone is secular and moderate? Oh, well, if he, if he doesn't have a beard he, uh, and he has a nice smile, okay, so he, he must be a moderate rebel. Sure enough, we have here U.S. Ambassador Robert Ford, uh, proud to meet with this uh, general from the Free Syrian Army, whatever they call the Free Syrian Army. And uh, great, okay, so this is the, the one they are training and helping. He's uh, mostly in Aleppo region. And here is the same general at the same time with Al-Qaeda and in fact I have so many videos of him where he's saying he's proud that Al-Mujahideen, Al-Muhajireen, all of them we worked with them they're great uh, they're all uh, wonderful people and we we have no problem working with them uh, and here I think I don't know if this is uh, the case they worked together to uh, to uh, defeat the Syrian army which was in control of one of the airports near Aleppo so Al-Qaeda took over an airport in Aleppo and the whole revolution was cheering even though the secular revolution is they say oh no no you know we're not uh, we're not for Al-Qaeda we're not for those Islamists this is not our revolution but yet every time the uh, the extremist rebels uh, enter a city and capture it or an airport and capture it you see all the rebels on facebook cheering oh we defeated the syrian army we got this airport we got uh, the city of of uh, of uh, Arraqqa. now they are embarrassed that uh, uh, daesh or uh, 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 islamic state of iraq and, Sy uh, and syria is in control of Arraqqa and they're beheading people every day now they're embarrassed of them but when they took over they did not mind because any anyone who defeats the Syrian regime, they cheer for them, including Al Qaeda. This is the uh, uh, well. I'll show you since we're here. Uh, this graphic I made of the the Syrian Opposition Alliance. Syrian Opposition Alliance to me is one block. Uh, I borrowed uh, Audi's uh, logo, but it's really four circles that are overlapping and they are one piece. Uh, it starts on the left with the fist that we've seen in Eastern Europe's revolution that was supposed to reassure us, look, this is another progressive uh, liberal uh, revolution. Well, that fist and the liberal opposition, the first circle, they are, they are allies and they're in love with what they call the Free Syrian Army. They always try to gather money for them, to lobby Western governments, to send them money and arms. And they love them. They're heroes for them. The Free Syrian Army is this vague concept that supposedly there are secular rebels, moderate rebels. Well, no, you don't have secular rebels. You have Islamists, uh, you have fundamentalist Islamists, Salafists, Jihadists, and crazy Al-Qaeda types. And they're all working together. So the liberal opposition on the left blends gradually into the Free Syrian Army that blends gradually into what is called the Islamic Front, which is Saudi Arabia's collection of uh, brigades and which blends nicely into the Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra Front, and the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. And we've seen recently the, uh, the Al-Qaeda types taking over uh, weapons that were meant for the Free Syrian Army. The Free Syrian Army did not resist, they just gave it to them. Anyways, so this is the opposition alliance that 
where the liberals are only the superficial nice cover nice book cover what's inside the book is not very nice and they are i'm always uh, disappointed the most in my former friends who call themselves liberal opposition i've lost my favorite friends it's the saddest thing uh they're just the facade for al-qaeda although they will tell you always no of course not we don't uh, this is the regime built this and it's not our mistake no it's exactly you because you are the ones who made it happen by uh providing your uh, beautiful uh, you know liberal and uh, progressive uh, cover to them otherwise they would have been exposed from day one and the western governments and western media and the western people would not have felt uh, uh, justified in supporting that co- that coalition of yours you made it happen for them and you are continuing to do that so that's again uh, one problem with the coalition um the other problem i have is that you know since day one it was clear that assad has enough support he had of course the states were or these are the pro government demonstrations in damascus a collection of them the government but they were also in aleppo and latakia in, in many cities so uh, the government would say for every demonstration oh it was millionia which means millions of people demonstrated which is nonsense the opposition does the same thing anytime they have somebody demonstrating for them they say oh millions demonstrated we never had millions in any of the syrian demonstrations we don't have the numbers but we had very large demonstrations still for example this one in mazde with a huge flag it was uh, about 100,000 people not a million but 100,000 is a large number this one downtown damascus was about 50 to 60,000 it's a smaller square this larger square the umayyad square in syria was uh, 150,000 roughly so um and others so uh, the regime was able to repeatedly demonstrate its ability to organize these were organized but doesn't mean people came there by force half of them came by you know because their school and factories told them look we have this demonstration today it will be great if you go so it was clear that we prefer you to go nobody was forced as the opposition would try to claim but yes it was organized and the other half was just like that you know i not half and half but uh, a good percentage of them were you know they're gathered organically uh, robert fisk was in one of them and he said 200,000 people were there and i looked at them they didn't appear organized they appeared like women with their children and they were all dancing and cheering and uh, nobody looked like they're forced to be here etc uh, many journalists covered it and they they also um, certified the same thing so uh, the coalition though did, decided to ignore this the coalition was sticking to its narrative that the opposition is much stronger it has the numbers the syrian people are here they're not with the regime so therefore this did not cover get coverage neither on cnn nor on al jazeera or Al arabia as a matter of fact al jazeera would would use some of these to pretend these are pro pro opposition um uh, uh, demonstrations like they will blend a picture like this where you don't see the Syrian the red flag the pro regime red flag they will blend it into some video that is pro opposition to show that the whole people the Syrian people are rebelling against the regime um, just in comparison so that you you get an idea of uh, how much uh, more popular Assad was compared to Mubarak if you look at uh, let me see if I find it here uh, Mubarak tried to do the same he tried to gather uh, supporters to demonstrate for him he couldn't uh, this is uh, al ahram which was pro mubarak at the time saying of course m- millions were there to demonstrate uh, pro mubarak which is not true of course the reason the only photo they posted was that zoomed in was that basically this is it this was it it was about 10000 i estimated at most and which which was shocking because cairo the city of cairo is five times bigger than the city of damascus in population it's like 20 million people compared to four millions in damascus yet despite having a five times advantage mubarak could not organize more than 10,000 supporters to be out i said many times had over a hundred thousand many many times so that tells you something but you did not want to see it that Assad will not be easy to remove like Mubarak not only because the army is well designed by the regime to be uh, to be uh, um, loyal but uh, because he had real support in Damascus Aleppo Latakia in Homs in I don't know Hasake Qamishli Suweida there are so many cities where 
the regime had genuine support. It doesn't mean everyone was there pro-regime, not at all, but they had serious support, which means the revolution does not make sense for Syria. A revolution is something where, you know, the people, I would say maybe 90% of the people are agree, and therefore there's no question about it. Uh, they will top it. Like, you know, in Romania, um, although that's not a great example, but uh, Nikolai Ceausescu was removed uh, with ease. They just shot him. The army captured him and they shot him and nobody protested. It was fine. They they removed Ceausescu. But Assad was not Ceausescu. Ceausescu was building a $3 billion palace for himself. Assad never did that. Uh, so uh, actually he was liked. He was popular. So, uh, so uh, um, again, mistake after mistake from the coalition. Then you had the opportunist. I don't know. This is an email that was received uh, by a friend of mine who's a Syria expert, and uh, he forwarded it to me. So this gentleman is telling him, "Look, I was uh, I, I was one of the uh, nominees for young global le leader by the World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, I have so and so company. I." I I removed the name here, but he has a, a very successful uh, corporation that uh, he did an IPO for. Um, he specialized in social change, and he was working on Libya, he said, at that point, March 26, 2011. And he says, now um, I decided to get involved in Syria. I do regime change. I also do regime change. Do you want to work together? So uh, it, you, you had that kind of thing since the beginning. People specialize in regime change. From He's a British uh, man by the way um, uh, what else I was going to show you you know the coalition's uh, part of the coalition you have this Rodwan Ziadi uh, an academic he's presented as an academic but he's also working with the worst type in Saudi Arabia those the supporters of Al-Qaeda like this gentleman here who's very much uh, uh, dying to uh, to overthrow the Syrian regime. It's so upsetting for a Syrian like me to see other Syrians uh, flying all the time to Saudi Arabia and Qatar and, uh, and finding their brothers there while uh, blocking me from Facebook and not taking my phone calls and everything. I'm focusing on myself as an example, but uh, I'm just one of uh, millions of uh, those who Syrians who did not like the revolution too much. Uh, then we have... Um, you know, France and other Western countries and Arab countries and Qatar, of course, telling us uh, here is uh, Qatar, you know, they designed a new logo. They decided to change the uh, Syrian, uh, all the symbols that Syria had. Uh, they have very nice graphic designers. They've decided to pick a prime minister who is a Muslim Brotherhood supporter from Texas. And uh, here is France uh, also on there. Uh, they decided who is the sole legitimate representative of the Syrian people. Uh, funny, funny that, you know, uh, in this case, they picked a religious figure, of course. Uh, he's a nice guy, but he doesn't know much about politics. I, I like him as a, he has good, he's a, he has good moral values, but he's not a politician. But anyway, the president of France, uh, Monsieur Hollande, uh, decided that this is the sole legitimate representative of Syrian people. And he received him at the Elysee Palace as a, as a president of a country. Um, um, where is it? I wanted to show you something while we're here. Um, I'm looking for here, yeah. So, uh, François Hollande himself, President of France, his popularity uh, last month went down another 6%, down to 15%. So he's not exactly the best representative of his own people trying to pick for us Syrians the sole and legitimate representative of the Syrian people. The same thing took place before where uh, Alain Juppé was in the same position next to uh, Burhan Ghalioun. Uh, this guy, Burhan Ghalioun, Alain Juppé, France, French foreign minister, during Sarkozy's time, was he decided this is the representative of the Syrian people. So it was really upsetting. Um, again, I'm going through the mistakes of the coalition. Uh, the, the way the uh, West uses and the Saudis and the Qataris, they all learned how to use opposition. They just you know, treat them as VIPs. Here, here is this one uh, meeting with President Bush. He's so proud to meet with a man who is hated in Syria. Um, here they're meeting with Secretary Clinton, etc. But uh, so I'll show you this practice. It goes way back to uh, when the British started it. Um, here is King Faisal, King of the Arab, is invited to a Wimbledon match, tennis match. Uh, he's sitting between Queen Mary and King George of Great Britain. Uh, look how proud he is. This always works on some types. I'll show you another one like that. 
you work with the West, they like you, they will pamper you. The system, the coalition will help you, not only the government. So let's let's look at Time magazine. Uh, Anwar Sadat, when he decided to make peace with Israel, uh, they loved him in the United States. So sure enough, from becoming an enemy of Israel and an adversary of the United States, he became a great guy. How do we do? How do we manufacture uh, that? Uh, you know, again, remember always that first pillar they built for you if you are on their to their liking. Uh, so he's the honorable and noble man. So let's manufacture that image now quickly. He was on Time magazine cover seven times, and I think seven times in a year and a half. Uh, so he was Time Man of the Year. He was on a sacred mission. He was. Uh, he was in charge of the new quest for peace, etc. So he was always there by Time magazine, as you know. And I think there was eventually an opinion poll where uh, the American people selected him as the most popular foreign re leader. All right. Uh, a sillier example is these two. Sadat was a likable person in general, maybe I can understand. But these two dictators, uh, military dictators who did a military coup in Syria, the United States wanted them to, to be in power. So even though they're dictators, uh, but they said they want to make peace with Israel. This General Hill, who was prime minister, he said he did promise he will make peace with Israel also. So here we have in the Library of Congress an ex exhibition uh, with this booklet that they made for them and their pictures, because there's really nothing to show. They just wanted to try to help them uh, appear like, oh, these are the good guys in Syria. The name of that booklet is Life in Modern Syria and Recent National Achievements of That Country. That was in 1952. I don't know what national achievement there were. It was a coup d'etat or what modern Syria was. But, uh, you know, Colonel Adib Shishakli and, uh, and uh, General Fauzi Solo were to the liking of the United States. And again, you know, we, we promote them. The morality pillar again, modern Syria and achievements, etc. Um, quickly, I will show... Uh, <coughs> I will show... Um, the uh, disappointing uh, left, the secular, the progressive, the liberal part of the opposition, supposedly. Uh, an example of uh, liberal opposition that was disappointing, Yassin al Saleh is one of the most uh, well-known figures. He's a thinker and, a, and a, a hero for the opposition. So I went, uh, I've been checking his Facebook page often and he knows me. From before, I asked him, Yasin, it's disappointing that the only thing I see every time I come to your page is people clapping and cheering you and calling you a hero and loving you and everything. Don't you have any critic ever here? I told him on my page, I always have critics. I never kick anybody out. Uh, uh, so why don't you have the same? And his response was sure enough in the predictable manner. He said, didn't you ask yourself, Otrakji, why is your reputation horrible? Why are you considered uh, a hired pen for the regime? Why are you a racist, supremacist, white supremacist, whatever, that hates his people, etc. And it got even worse. Uh, he says, get the hell out of here. You're so sticky. Don't you have any dignity? We don't want you around here. Out, out, out. Okay, so uh, that's how open-minded they are for criticism. And by the way, it's the same thing anywhere I went, um, not anywhere, in 80-90% of uh, among the revolutionary liberals that I used to have as friends. Um, then what was much more alarming, and I please, I would like you to just understand to which degree this is uh, uh, alarming to somebody who's secular, um, is that sec sectarianism uh, is not deterred by the fact someone is secular and he drinks wine or his wife could wear a bikini at the swimming pool. These are two separate uh, cons constructs. So I'm going to show you three examples of people who are genuinely liberal in their own lifestyle. They have fun in their life. They're, you know, uh, they're westernized. You would like them. I would like them. However, sectarianism could still be... Uh, in their mindset so uh, here is one she is the liberal wife of a liberal husband who were very rich in Syria they're considered one of the corrupt business people but now they defected uh, and they are against the regime so 
she is saying, oh, uh, Sayyid Qutb, who is one of the spiritual leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood, we miss you, we miss you, we need you back to lead us, and uh, we need uh, the Islamic uh, uh, law to govern our states, we should be an Islamic uh, nation, etc. And she's supposed to be secular. Uh, she continues to claim she's secular. Uh, and then she is a Shia hater. She watched MBN, which is a, a, a Shia Lebanese channel, and she said everybody's ugly. The actors and actresses are ugly. I've never seen uglier people in my life. Uh, this is absolutely horrible. I would throw up uh, by looking at these people. Uh, then this is a friend, a former friend, who also told me, "Oh, I love to drink Iraq and uh, dance dabke, and you know, I love music, etc." The first day there was a demonstration in Syria. The first day he got so empowered, and he flipped this and he posted on his Facebook wall this poetry par- from uh, quoting from uh, Al Mufakir Suri Islam Attar. He's the uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, intellectual Islam Attar. He's quoting him that oh Islam, oh Islam, this is your time now. You're gonna come back now, and uh, this is the new dawn of Islam. Okay, again he was secular overnight. He turns to uh, to be uh, an Islamist. Um, Last one from uh, a good friend in uh, in the United States. Last year, when the Free Syrian Army was formed and was starting to make uh, to to uh, score some victories on this uh, over the Syrian Army, uh, he got absolutely euphoric one day and he wrote, "Oh, the history is repeating itself. Uh, this desert area in between Damascus and Aleppo, Homs and whatever, has been where uh, the soldiers of Muhammad have." achieves their victories and they will do this against the soldiers of Muhammad and they will wipe out all the cities between them and the coast. They will throw everybody in the sea. That means all the minorities in the cities in this in the coastal area in Syria and Lebanon. You have the Alawites, the Ismailis and the Druze and uh, some Christians and whatever. So this is not something to be taken lightly. Uh, and it was all over the place. It was. It became acceptable kind of uh, language to 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 see among those who call themselves liberals. Um, uh, let me see what I wanted to share with you. Something here. Yeah, it reminds me of you know they call for human rights, and in the United Nations Human Rights International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, I will jump to number nineteen and twenty. Number nineteen and twenty say that. Uh, Everyone shall have the right to hold opinions without interference. Uh, the revolution would always try to silence those who disagree with them. They will come up with qawa'im al they call it, or uh, shame lists. Any, uh, any artist that decides to criticize the revolution, they place their name on shame lists and they tell them, once we take over, we will punish you. Same thing with regime supporters anywhere. In fact, many of those on shame lists were killed. So... That's Article 19. The uh, revolutionaries claiming they are for uh, human rights. Apparently, they did not he- read it. Uh, then we look at responsibilities. It says that there, are, you know, you have the, the freedom to express your opinion, but you have responsibilities also. One, for respect of rights or reputations of others, and they did not give a damn about reputation of others. Two, for the protection of national security or of public order or of public health or morals. They destroyed Syria. They went, they introduced chaos into Syria. And you in the coalition supported them. To you, everything, all the tactics they used were fine, even though many of those tactics were building anger. That's what they were doing. They were manufacturing anger all the time. Of course, the regime also contributed by making huge mistakes by using violence, but the opposition side did more, I would say, and nobody protested. Uh, Article 20 says, any propaganda for war shall be prohibited by law. Yet the opposition was always into propaganda for war, always saying, oh, please attack Syria, please do. Uh, I mean, uh, I'll come to this now in a second. I'll show you examples. To any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence shall be prohibited by law. And they were constantly in the revolution side, inciting uh, against the Shia, the Alawites, and uh, often the minorities, and against Hezbollah, against Iran, calling for wiping them completely off the map, basically, as many of them would say that. Actually, let me see if I have an example. Um, Do I have an example here? 
Uh, no, I have it somewhere else. I'll try to find it. So, um, I don't know where is that example because it's useful to find. Just a moment. Yeah, it's here. This gentleman has 40,000 followers and he wrote when the Israel, I, th I think when Israel attacked the Syrian army uh, weapons depot, he wrote, oh, forgive me history, but, uh, you know, I will just declare that I'll be very happy if we wipe out Hezbollah and we destroy Iran's uh, uh, military. Even if Israel will do that, we would love it and we will thank Israel for doing that for us. We think this is a message of peace for the Arabs, for us Arabs. So. But it's just a sample. You see that kind of language everywhere, uh, sometimes direct, sometimes insinuated. Uh, again, this Article 20 says this is prohibited by law. Um, all right, so uh, I will uh, show you what's the was the most popular way they would uh, they would engage in propaganda for war. Uh, let me see where it is. Was it here? Yeah. Uh, pages like this, uh, we are all the child Hamza al Khatib, that are extremely popular, 758,000 members, uh, and I'll come back to these members. Uh, they will show you nothing but pictures of children, children suffering, children suffering, uh, children dying, uh, you're gonna see it. And there's always Erdogan, by the way, they always love Erdogan Prime because they are Muslim Brotherhood page. Uh, you, you see children here dead, etc children dead and etc so you would think that they are humanists and they're saying please let's stop the war so that these suffering children will not be suffering anymore no they are using pictures of children to call for an invasion of syria by the us to call for much heavier weapons for the rebels um of course their logic is oh you know this is the only way we can uh, we can end the conflict no you cannot end the conflict you will just make it much more bloody because if you have more weapons you're going to enter damascus maybe and if you enter damascus you will destroy it like you destroyed aleppo uh, because the regime has their probably 50,000 of its best most best trained uh, troops to protect the city so anyway that's they just want more weapons and they want the united states to come and invade syria to help them win and they're using pictures of dead children and suffering children all the time it's not only them i noticed on the vast majority of pages that they can they continuously use children and suffering every day are the ones calling for war they are engaging in propaganda for war so this humanitarianism is is fake in most cases uh, and coming back by the way since we're here i'm coming back why they have prime minister erdogan here they always show him uh, and why they have 700 and what was it 58,000 members if we check the actual numbers of this page because we can get statistics on every Facebook page uh, We realize they're probably Muslim Brotherhood coalition from across the Arab world uh, So from Egypt you have 43% of the members of the page from Morocco from Tunisia Jordan then from Syria 5.8% this is Although people will get the impression that all oh, the Syrian people love the revolution because 758,000 are on the page. No, the vast majority, 93%, 94% are, are from uh, other Arab countries where the Muslim Brotherhood are strong. Okay, so that's uh, uh, the coalition. Let me see if there's anything I would say. There's of course always the Islamists that the United States and others they taught them how to this is from Libya This is from Syria, you know, just cut down your beard to a size we can handle And we'll teach you a few politically correct uh, Terminology that you can use and you know, this is how before and after this is before and after we turn you into an activist and that we can present on For our Western media and nobody will be scared of you. We'll call you a moderate Islamist There's tons of money to be paid, of course. Here is uh, this gentleman who is presented as, you know, the uh, 
the artist of the revolution, Ali Farzat, and he's actually an excellent cartoonist. And I did a website for him before for free because I was proud he's a Syrian cartoonist. But uh, here he is now in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and saying, oh, I respect and uh, stand and salute uh, the marvelous uh, Saudi king, uh, the, the free and liberal Mar- uh, Saudi king, whatever, uh, and the hell to the Security Council because Saudi Arabia had a problem with the United Nations. So uh, this is supposedly an independent Syrian artist. But I, would, I, don't, I find it hard to believe that he's not uh, paid to whatever. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> let me see. All right, so uh, let's go back to, so we've covered the coalition. Now I would like to cover, um, let me see what's next. By the way, while, while I'm here, just before I forget, the day after project that the United States for Peace, along with European foreign ministries from Switzerland and Norway, I think, and many other parties worked on, their calculation was that the regime is about to fall. And that was in, let's say, they finished it in August 2012. I'm a one person, you know, that they decided not to talk to people like us from the uh, non-revolution side. Here's an article I wrote just after the day after project to criticize it. I said the day after project will be too late because you will not topple the regime. We're going to have much more casualties and you're absolutely wrong in what you're predicting. You cannot run Syria after that. It will be destroyed. So... Just to show you how accurate was a person like me, a random person who is not on their opposition side, in 2000, in uh, at that time in uh, September 2012, the casualty number was 22,000. So I told them, look, we are here, right? If you're dreaming that the regime is going to be toppled very soon, you're wrong. The regime is not going to be toppled for years. If you continue the fight, it's going to take years and years. And not only that, I notice at the curve. I'm a scientist, by the way, I publish uh, in scientific journals. Uh, so I know statistics and probabilities a bit. So I looked at this curve and I noticed it started to accelerate up. And also studying the situation in Syria, I felt that there's more weapons now among the Free Syrian Army. They have more rebels showing in their YouTube videos. So I anticipated there will be an ex- exponential increase in the rate of casu- in the casualty rate. So to the best of my ability, this is the plot I came up with predicting that your, that your day after is not coming here, it's coming in a few years later, after we have huge, massive number of casualties. So I said, look, we are 22,000 now, only after a year and a half. At two years, we're going to be 65,000. At two and a half years, we will be 115,000. Uh, and look what happened. This is in uh, February 2013, which is after six months after that uh, article I wrote and the, and the graph I came up with, it was actually approaching 70,000. And I said it will be here 65,000, which means approaching 70,000. And then I said after two and a half years, it will be 115,000. And look at that. In uh, October 2013, it was indeed 115,000 exactly. But so why did one person like me with access to nothing, no intelligence or anything, I just have my ability to extrapolate from the numbers and from reading of looking at YouTube videos where I saw rebels increasing in numbers and equipment. Why did I get it absolutely precisely right? Whereas the combined efforts of Swiss foreign ministry and Norway and all these Syrian uh, intellectuals from opposition get it absolutely wrong because they are because they did not need to to think. They have this international coalition that was spoiling them, and anything they said was considered automatically uh, the truth. Um, and because there's a lot of emotional uh, uh, decision-making processes taking place as opposed to rational decision-making process. Okay, so let's, let's look at the results of this, coal, of this um, revolution. It was a huge failure, a massive failure, because the revolution said, look, this is how Syria was before. We don't like it. It's going to be much better. We're going to have freedom, more freedom. We're going to have dignity. We're going to have economic growth, no political prisoners. We'll end corruption. 
will have equal opportunity, no more torture in Syrian prisons, the Syrian people will be united, and all of that will be peaceful. Sell me, sell me, sell me. Was Syria that bad? Yeah, well, maybe it was bad in certain aspects. It was not bad at all in others. So we had freedoms. Women's rights were not bad in Syria. Minority rights were great. Um, we had some dignity. Syrians were a proud nation because they would. They're, it's an independent country. But of course, we didn't have dignity when uh, security forces would uh, torture you if you are a political prisoner. But that's a minority who, who, who go through that. The poor did not feel dignified completely because we had a lot of poor people in Syria. Unfortunately, it's not a rich country. But other than that, we had enough sufficient dignity in many ways. We had no foreign debt. We had 3,000 political prisoners out of 24 million population. It's a number that's similar to the other countries around us in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, etc., U.S. allies. Uh, we had corruption. It was very bad, but it was exactly... Uh, equivalent to the corruption in Lebanon and it was better than the corruption in Iraq. Lebanon and Iraq are democracies supposedly. They have democratic elections. Uh, so it's not related to having a dictatorship or not. It's it's a regional phenomena. It's cultural. Okay. We had mask unemployment. Uh, probably the real unemployment was about 30-40% but the government would hire people unnecessarily. They pay them a salary to pretend they are working. Uh, we had torture in the hundreds because 3,000 political prisoners, probably hundreds were tortured. We had minimal sectarianism. Did the revolution improve things? No. We went down instead of going up. We went to the uh, black uh, end result after 33 months of the crisis. We have 120,000 dead Syrians, 9.3 million homeless outside their homes, uh, either internally displaced or refugees outside the country. Uh, we have so many rebels now calling for Islamic Caliphate. We have 40,000 jihadists from out of, ta out of, you know, from all over the world, 86 countries, I think. We have torture by all. The regime is torturing more than before, and the revolution is torturing people. We have sectarianism. It's on the rise. Uh, we have corruption much more. Everybody's corrupt because the, the, it's not, it's a lawless place. We have much more unemployment. We have $200 billion to, to borrow somehow to rebuild the country. We had no foreign debt before. 100,000 political prisoners. We had before 3,000 political prisoners. We have terror instead of freedoms. We have humiliation. So that's the result of the revolution that did not deliver any of its promises. Why this failure? The strategic level the failure was because the green flag revolutionaries were convinced and and their supporters in the co coalition convinced them also that they should not talk to the regime they will defeat the regime just defeat the regime don't talk to anyone who's supporting the regime just continue to defeat the regime you will do it soon okay so if they decide not, for no dialogue so they chose war they chose war so I'm blaming them in the first place. Next, I will blame the regime because the regime also said, OK, well, look, whatever I'm giving you as an offer, you're telling me it's not enough, too late. We want to topple the regime. So if that's your attitude, we're giving you nothing. No, ref no more reforms. We tried a bit at the beginning. You didn't like it. Well, too bad. You didn't like the constitution we came up with. You didn't like the uh, uh, parliamentary election. Well, too bad. Of course, the regime is to blame because those parliamentary, parliamentary elections were horrible. They were also like fixed, probably. The new constitution was better than before. They finally removed the Ba'ath Party, uh, the Ba'ath Party's intimate connection to the state and to the army and to the educational system and everything. All of that is gone now, so that's great. But still, it's not a, a perfect uh, constitution. It could be much better. Uh, the regime could have worked with the Syrian people, bypassed the green flag revolutionary activists and figures, and they could have communicated with Syrian people saying, look, forget all of that. Let's all to talk together, uh, people to people, about how we would like this new constitution to be. To be, let's conduct another uh, parliamentary election where it's absolutely, you know, free. Everybody's free to run, etc. Uh, the regime did not do that. They just became a hostage to the green flag uh, revolutionaries because the regime was saying, "Okay, we're sitting here and waiting. When you're ready to talk, we're ready to talk. You wanna do it? Go to Geneva, we'll go. You wanna do it in Damascus, we'll go in Damascus." But again, the regime also failed. But the main uh, party to blame here is the revolutionaries and their supporters in the coalition who told them, don't talk to the regime, you're going to topple it. And of course, I'm not 
talking about the Islamists with the, with the black flag because they don't want to talk anyway. They say, Latin sunnah min salih du'aikum, which means just pray for us and we are the ones who will lead the show. All right. Um, I'll look at the moral issue. The If you look at the seven cardinal sins, you'll find them in most of the people active in the Syrian crisis. So there's no wonder this turned into a bloodshed because it wasn't inspired by great value systems. It was inspired by, uh, by uh, what you're seeing on the screen here. Uh, again, I'm generalizing, but this, is, this applies to a large number of the, of the activists on both sides, on all sides, okay? I mean, the regime, the revolution, outside supporters, etc. Lust for fame and power and money, okay? You see that in politics always, and it's the case in Syria. Syrian opposition activists, the, the major figures, most of them, they were competing for their own, you know, future uh, roles to play. Uh, so, yeah, lust for fame and money and power. Uh, even sex, if you want to use lust for sex here, uh, the, uh, the, uh, we had the jihadists who believed if they die, they will have uh, 72 virgins in heaven. Uh, okay, next one is gluttony and greed. And for that, I would blame more the regime side because they haven't had enough of many things. They could have shared power much more uh, convincingly, but no, they were very hesitant to share enough. Uh, sloth, which is laziness. Uh, blaming the Syrian center, the moderate, rational, experienced uh, Syrians who stayed on the side. They did not want to uh, try to help uh, publicly to try to influence uh, the the uh, narrative to, towards the center, towards a more realistic narrative away from the two propagandist narratives. So, yeah, you can blame the people in the center for that, the risk-averse Syrians. Then wrath, anger, impatience seeking revenge that's mostly in the revolution side but you can see it on the re on the regime side it it it's behind it's what drives a lot of the activism it's not oh i'm supporting the syrian people's cause or no i'm there to take revenge i'm really angry i really want to win now i can't wait okay then envy anybody who wanted to take something on the other side that's not his or hers uh pride and ego uh, and for that uh, uh, I would uh, use this quote on the upper left of the screen. I don't know if you can read it. It's in small text. It's by uh, Reid Hoffman, uh, the, one of the founders of LinkedIn, the, the ultra-successful social uh, networking site for job search, etc. Uh, he said, social networks do best when they tap into one of the seven deadly sins. Uh, Facebook is ego. LinkedIn is greed. So yes, Facebook is often ego. You, you'll try to engage in discussions with others and you'll rarely see somebody telling you, okay, I think you're right in this one. No, they will just argue until the end to win a discussion. Uh, so yeah, a lot of the uh, what was supposed to be uh, egos uh, discussions that would lead to learning never led to learning. They, you have now two, uh, two camps in Syria that have a huge gap between them polarization was taking place a day after the others and no matter how much social media was supposed to provide us with tools for dialogue what it did was provide us for tools for polarization to fight each other intellectually supposedly so that's partially why we're here uh, and in fact uh, i have a let me see if it's here i have i want to share with you um, this graph while we're on the subject of morality Look, the way I see it, forget regime and opposition and Syrians and non-Syrians. Anyone who played any role during this, the past two and a half to three years, that resembles the list that you're seeing on the left, he, try, he or she tried to open the stab of blood to contribute to the bloodshed and the violence. Anyone who, whose role could be described by the list on the right was trying to close the tap was trying to to uh, to engage in uh, conflict resolution <laughs> uh, so look at the risk yourself uh, the, the risk yourself uh, on the on and ask yourself what how was my activism was it uh, intended to escalate to uh, to help my side win to uh, separate Syrians between good and bad to add to chaos and noise 
was I arrogant when people who disagreed with me tried to talk to me? Was I angry and hateful? Was I revengeful, revenge seeking? Did I seek for an intervention and promote it and call for it? Did I call for arming the rebels or anyone? Did I go and protest? Uh, and and uh, did I go to the Russian foreign ministry and say please send arms to the Syrian regime or go to the uh, to the uh, American uh, uh, you know Congress and uh, lobby them to send arms to the rebels? Was I sectarian in my language? Did I increase sectarianism? Did I try to bankrupt the Syrian state through protests and whatever? Supposedly they were called uh, peaceful protesting, but they were aiming to pro to uh, to bankrupt the state. If I did any of that, then I was I contributed to death. People died in from escalation and polarization and, and anger and hate and everything and sectarianism. On the right, it's rare. I found a few Syrians like that and a few non-Syrians and I've always fell in love with their activism and told them you are amazing. Uh, very few were engaged in truth instead of propaganda. They were trying to communicate with all sides, engage in negotiations, give and take, patience, understanding, uh, common grounds, love your enemy, humility, moderation, forgiveness, acceptance, and empathy. Okay, so ask yourself which type were you on? And again, this applies to both sides. <clears throat> Uh, finally, uh, I would like to look at this. When the conflict started, I gave a few interviews during which I've always been saying, watch it, you'll open Pandora's box. If you open the door in Syria, you, you will have a large number of conflicts, Syrian, regional and international conflicts that are waiting for a proper playground for them to start interacting with each other and complicate things to a point where we cannot solve the crisis. At the time I was ridiculed because, oh, you're a regime supporter, you're over complicating things, uh, you're a sophist, uh, you are just trying to find arguments to, uh, to uh, cover the fact that this is simply uh, the people revolting against a dictator, they want their freedom and dignity. Don't over complicate things. No, none of that applies. Just forget it. These are regime excuses. We've had enough of them. Well, sure enough, they are not regime excuses. This is what, what happened exactly. Uh, I'm just giving you here on this list a, a list of 12 conflicts that are now uh, on stage in Syria. And good luck for anyone in conflict resolution to try to bring all the players to agree because these conflicts, they have players and they have agendas, they have demands, they have fears, they have aspirations, different from one to the other. The first one is the rich versus the poor, and we see it in Syria. The second one is the Kurdish dilemma. It brought back the Kurdish question to the surface. It was being managed by Syria and Turkey and, every, and Iraq. But now, no, you have to deal now with a serious question. What do we do with the Kurdish population in these countries? You know, now they're armed, they're in control of northeastern Syria, etc. The third one is the Wahhabi Sufi, the Wahhabi war on Sufi Islam. So Syria's version of Islam is the moderate one, is the most beautiful religion. You, you can, if, for those of you who don't know it, um, but increasingly the past few decades it was moving influenced by the wahhabis who were spending tons of monies they have their satellite stations they send money to uh, to preachers in syria and to egypt and pakistan and jordan and palestine they've really affected this the uh, the population which was very liberal in the 60s and 70s they became conservative to ultra conservative in especially in egypt and pakistan for example in gaza in syria it's half half uh, so yeah this is a war from wahhabi islam saudi based uh, and Qatari based on Sufi Islam from Syria mostly uh, and some in Turkey uh, and we see this in Egypt also they were trying to burn down uh, Sufi uh, mosques anyway then it's number four is the Sunni Shia conflict I don't need to remind you that on the regime side we have Iran and Iraq and Hezbollah on the opposition side we have Turkey and Qatar and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and Kuwait uh, the, basically the Sunni versus the Shia axis and it's not it did not explode yet but it's waiting there at the door it's about to Okay, Saudi Arabia now are not very rational. I don't know what they're planning to do, but this could really take place in the next few months if we don't go out of our, our way to stop it finally. Number five is the secular versus religious conflict. We saw it again. This is not only in Syria. It's, it happened in, in Tunisia, in Egypt. In Egypt, they got rid of the Muslim Brotherhood after electing them. They knew they made a huge mistake. Now they banned them. In Tunisia, they're waiting to do the same. And in Syria, the regime and its supporters like me 
are adamant that we will not allow religion into politics because it's absolutely destructive. We see it in Lebanon, we see it in Iraq. Religion and politics do not mix, definitely not in the Middle East. Then number six is the Middle East conflict, the Arab-Israeli conflict. Sure enough, Israel did interfere in the conflict. They bombed the Syrian armies. Uh, they posed a few times. Spectacular explosions took place. And they're interfering by working with the Saudis behind the scene against Syria and Iran. Uh, number seven is Russia versus the United States. You know, this was uh, waiting to happen. And for Russia, this was the opportunity to come back as a superpower. And they successfully did so. Uh, then, uh, But again, this part of the conflict in Syria. Number eight is the militant Islam or what's called terror, which is Al-Qaeda. We forgot about Al-Qaeda, but now this conflict in Syria brought back Al-Qaeda to the center stage where the Europe is scared now of them. Uh, number nine is Lebanon. Lebanon's conflict into, was part of the Syrian conflict. And from day one, uh, the Saad Hariri Saudi allies were uh, arming the rebels in Syria and uh, helping them in any way they can and financing them. And recently, the last this year in 2013, Hezbollah started also to send uh, their fighters to train in Syria and to fight. Uh, so, and the the conflict is affecting Lebanon also because now they will have no elections anymore. And you cannot have elections. You cannot have proper uh, prime minister, uh, uh, prime ministerial election, etc. For anybody, it's just uh, not going to happen anymore. Uh, it's waiting for the Syria crisis to be resolved. Number 10 is urban versus the rural. We realize outside Damascus and outside Aleppo, the population is poorer and much more conservative. It's not compatible with the population within the Syria, uh, within Damascus and Aleppo. And that's another conflict that we saw. Uh, number 11 was the biggest one, maybe, is the uh, competition between, on the one hand, Qatar, Turkey, and the Muslim Brotherhood. On the other hand, is Saudi Arabia and the Wahhabis. And these are two projects for, for Islam to take over the region. And each one has its own flavor. And they were competing in Syria. They both have their own uh, brigades and their own funding uh, channels and etc. And people are dying until these two uh, regional powers fight it in Syria. Uh, number 12 is France and the UK finding an opportunity to play roles. Because the United States, after spending trillions and trillions of dollars on Iraq and not knowing what to do with it, uh, why they did that. And the same thing with Afghanistan. They decided, President Obama at least decided he's not in the mood for another war. So France and the UK, they found an opening for them to come back and play a bigger role. So this is just a dozen and I can give you another 10 easily. Syria is central to so many things. And it was so obvious at the beginning that if we open the door to chaos... There's no closing this door back. It's not going to be easy because now we want all these regional and international and local Syrian players to agree on something called a solution. So good luck with that. And I hope you. I hope I was not very uh, uh, aggressive in my uh, tone or in my collection here. But again, this was not meant to be balanced. The regime is absolutely horrible too. Uh, but it's you know this is politics. No, no one is an angel. And. Uh, Let's not stop at the Assad killed too many people because the United States, as I started this, uh, and many Europeans have killed much, much more, uh, so uh, many, many more people around the, the globe. And, uh, and the idea is to save, to prevent killing the next 120,000 as part of the conflict. Uh, so I hope you keep that in mind if you're trying, when you're working hard on trying to find solutions for the crisis. Just look in the mirror and say, what did I do wrong and how can I also change my attitude towards this this uh, Syrian crisis? And many thanks for those of you who have, who have uh, stuck until this point.